Welcome to Espresso Talks, your source for interviews with a wide range of unique people from diverse backgrounds around the world. I'm your host, Anthony T. Eaton. Hey, Noah, how are you? Well, hello. <laughs> I'm doing well. I was looking at your profile and I saw that you went to Concordia College. Yeah. Well, I mean, the my education is a, is a story among itself, but two of my best mates still live in uh, Minnesota. They work for the National Guard out in Minnesota. We've done some great trainings with Together Travel the World. We spent a summer in Croatia together. I'm always threatening to get back there and, and be with yeah. them, but then I'm like, well, it's coming fall and winter and I don't want to be in Minnesota for the winter. That's why I don't <laughs> live there anymore. I was what? definitely like at the, the vanguard of adult learning when that started happening. So, you know, I graduated from high school in 1995 and did some volunteer service and some military service that really left me at a young age, you know, like 21 and 22, I was already having kids and I was living and working in DC and the whole online education was just starting to bud. I had done night classes and weekend courses and, and tried to follow as traditional route as possible. And so then really kind of thank the gods that technology started to enable distance learning and Concordia was great. Um, I had done uh, the majority of my undergrad through the University of Maryland system. And then I was working for a nonprofit foundation for private colleges and universities. It was a fundraising association for private colleges. And they said, well, we'll pay to complete your degree if you go to a private college. And Concordia uh, had a blended system where you could do some courses distance and then go for a couple months and then do some courses distance and go to a couple months. So I actually never lived permanently in Minnesota and just okay. kind of shared a flat with friends that were in similar circumstances, but it was, it was cool. And then after graduation, it was like, there's completely online models, but in the beginning, there was a lot of distrust surrounding how do you measure things like pedagogy and the, the adult learners retention on an online platform. So that was my adult learning experience. Now I'm the father of, of two grown kids. One's just graduated from college this year and the other's a junior and I think creating that residential lived experience was super important to me in, yeah. in their education, even though they were wicked smart and took concurrent credit and wanted to graduate early. I was like, don't sell yourself short because right. you watched me as in your young lives when I was doing master's work of, of the weekends hold away in the front room, trying to write a paper or something. So. That's awesome that you were able to accomplish that. I think the technology is amazing. So what drew you into serving in the military and the National Guard? What, what's the background story on that? <sighs> well, it's, it's difficult or it's nuanced to describe yourself in today's culture um, when you were represented as a young person in things that were previously like espoused as like the epitome of, of good in our, in our culture. So, you know, I grew up very much like the all American mom and apple pie kind of kid, captain of the swim team, student body president, and was always motivated in my life by a st strong sense of duty, you know, volunteering in the community, being active in the congregation, just those types of things. So when it came time to graduate from high school, the army was kind of an obvious choice. In retrospect, I know I didn't get all the best recommendations or advice from parents and peers or even the recruiter, but um, I grew up in a military family. My grandfather was a World War II veteran. My uncle was, served in Vietnam and they were kind of my heroes growing up. And you know, also grew up consuming 1980s cinema and media where, you know, watching Magnum P.I. and realizing he was a veteran and Rambo and right. all that kind of stuff. And even though later on in my life, if I would point to how that those types of things created a stigma that we're still facing in the veteran space today. But it was just kind of a, a logical step growing as, uh, out, up out west. And it just I, I had those characteristics that the military wanted and and it was a good it was a good motivation and, and something to do to, you know to get out of the city I grew up in and from a very blue collar family with not a lot of options and how am I going to pay for school and and you know 9-11 hadn't happened yet and we were still just 
barely getting into like you know the bosnia stuff of the late 90s the balkans right right that was like graduate level geopolitics that my you know senior in high school mind couldn't really wrap itself around but as i learned about genocide and tribalism and the impacts of cultural differences in politics then i started to say like well i want to study that and um so i served in the army just as an enlisted soldier and was a reservist for a few years and trying to cut my teeth in the corporate world as well. And then I decided, you know, I really like my army job to be my only job. And so I went to officer candidate school in 2005 and then really found a niche in strategic planning and in operations. I'm an active duty guardsman. So I work full time, but it's one of the best kept secrets. I only travel when I want to. It's given me the opportunity to travel the world. The National Guard does things called state partnership programs where each state is married up with a developing nation. But some are NATO partners. So we, I got to spend a few years going back and forth from Cambodia to help develop their national defense, which was kind of like a Chinese deterrent. And I think now Cambodia is a vessel state for China, unfortunately. And there hasn't yeah. been a lot that we're doing there. Croatia and Germany... And just getting the opportunity to go work with NATO tar- partners and do that kind of planning and stuff. Um, even currently, you know, Poland just purchased a whole bunch of Abrams tanks from foreign military sales of the of the government. They've reached out and we're brokering that deal on how do we help them develop and train. And strategically, what happens is we, they're an enabler to Russian deterrence right. in, in Eastern Europe, but they're also a NATO partner. And so you know, the details of that are still flushing out, but it's, you know, stuff that I wouldn't have expected in, you know, my 17 year old self to say like, oh, one day you're going to do those type of things. That's really cool. I think that exposure that you get to all of those things that you mentioned, the cultural exposure for sure that most people never ever get the opportunity to experience, uh, to see how things are in other countries. How has it formed you as a a leader in what you do? How has that formed and shaped your leadership style? Well, I think what the military does, I say the military broadly, but uh, my examples are specifically army, but I think all branches are similar, but the army more so is that leadership is not a result of your function. So maybe in the corporate world, you're in HR or accounting or sales or operations. And because you're great at your function, you start to rise into managerial positions. And then you are are a leader. You're maybe the senior vice president. So you're starting to then influence people to reach the outcomes that you want that they may not be able to get to on their own. But your leadership is born out of function. I think that's why there's a whole industry surrounding leader development and organizational development and the psychology of the workplace and hosting interventions to build people's soft skills. But the military espouses leadership above your function. I've never been given, maybe once I've been given a duty assignment because of my leadership attributes, but I'm expected to be a leader no matter where the army put, puts me in to, to work. So I've been a right. human resources officer with no you know, formal training. They, you can go to school and get the training, but you're a leader, so go run this organization. Um, operations at different echelons, strategic planning, so really what it taught me is that this, what we call our ethos, my, my personal values and characteristic are always held above the job function. And so a lot of military transitioning service members have a difficult time articulating their value proposition to the civilian world because they're like, well, I'm a leader. And we all take that for granted. Like, of course, you're, because we placed our leadership above our function, it's our number one pin. This is me. I'm a leader. And so then the world's like, Hey, that's cool, but we don't care what your rank was. And we don't care like that. You're a leader, but what did you do? What skills do you have that are transferable into our company? To your point, those who have transitioned back into the civilian world, oftentimes struggle with how to translate that skill was. I, I, I can see it as an HR professional. It makes perfect sense to me articulating what I did in my military role how it would apply mm-hmm. to a, a company setting or a, a civilian setting. I think a lot of military personnel really struggle with that. Yeah, and I, I would say 
as much that there's a whole industry evolving around that, around coaches and human resource professionals that are targeting transitioning service members and how to yes. write that resume, how to present yourself, how to create a brand. Some great guys like um, Michael Quinn, Matt Quick are loud voices in that space, but there are dozens and dozens of people and there's some great nonprofits that are helping with transition. I think the, the Department of Defense is got some great programs. They have a thing called the skill bridge program where a service member transitioning the, out when they're at the 180 day mark, the government actually underwrites their salary to go work in like an internship at a company. And everybody agrees that this is going to lead to a job. Oh, really? um, it's not open to everybody, but it's gaining a lot of traction. And, but the skill bridge program is pretty cool for a lot of people who are big fish in small ponds, meaning they've worked, they've only worked in military bases and they don't have a network out in the civilian sectors. They don't know what industries they want to get into. And so they can kind of find that mentorship and without the pressure of, but also how will I put food on the table tonight? Cause yeah. I need to be paid. So I'm a huge fan of that. Um, but I also think, you know, I, I believe that a lot of the hallmarks of leadership that we value in the corporate world. Their genesis was found in military service, whether that was through a service academy route, you know, like you were a West Point or an Annapolis graduate. And then, but I think we can also even find the influences of Japan and post-war lean practices were all about Japanese and American influences working together like at Toyota to, to create this streamline, remove the fat, get the job done type of approach to manufacturing. I think that's one thing that aided our economy post-World War II was just the influence of those lean practices. And it, it's kind of the reimagining of, of the Henry Ford approach. The Industrial Revolution obviously um, is gone, but the same principles can apply in business today that mm -hmm. applied back then on Again, efficiencies. You come across companies who they embrace this, the Kaizen approach, right? The oh, it, constant improvement through small little changes. And that's something the military does innately. Like when we do anything, we always conduct this after action review and the preponderance of time is focused on, well, what didn't happen that should have happened or what were the obstacles to in the process and how do we remove that and what changes do we need to make? On the flip side of that, I think a lot of organizations struggle as well to understand some of the challenges that military, former military face as they make that transition back into the civilian mm -hmm. uh, corporate America. The military is very structured in, in many ways. In corporate America, it tends to be not as structured and more fluid. So that ability to embrace that when you're used to this very clear hierarchy of how orders come down right. and there's probably less autonomy in the military, I would think, than there is in corporate America, depending on your organization. There's a couple of things unpacked there. I think there is this idea in the military of mission command where a senior says to a group, this is the end state. These are the goals. So it's kind of a design method of thinking like, here's our current conditions. Here's the conditions that we want. Now you go and create those lines of effort to achieve those conditions. The, all branches of service also though have irregular warfare, special operations, people that are, you know, educated to think against the stream and, and to come up with innovative ideas. But another way, another lens we could view this veteran transition in is through the DE islands. Post-World War II veterans made 12% of the population and today veterans are less than 1%. So as we're looking uh, to promote diversity in the workplace, we have a underemployed pocket uh, demographic of skilled workers and leaders that um, sometimes have negative biases and prejudice because of their military service. Like, well, I would love to bring you in, but you know, you were in the army, you are that militant, can't think outside yeah. the box, must be told everything to do. We can share that equity in hiring for people who have, you know, served their nation. How do we create deliberate seats at the table for those folks? I'm definitely all about equal pay and gender integration in the military to opening jobs to all people and the whole LGBTQ plus community. I think sometimes the military is kind of a control group. We 
test social issues inside the military. Um, I was celebrating the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell the other day, and I wrote a little article on LinkedIn to just say, I remember when that happened, I was a company commander in Iraq. And of all the things I was dealing with there, that was super important. And we had to have some deliberate discussions about that. And there was a lot of biases and people's thinking needed to shift around yeah. that. Some companies are creating deliberate cohorts, pipelines to employment for veterans. If it's less than 1% of the population, then a seat at the table should be for the veteran as well as, as any other. Group. I absolutely agree. I think that, you know, we should not see unemployment of our veteran people. I understand that it's more complex than that, but I think for those who have the ability and the desire to have a job, there's no reason somebody who's transitioning out of the military should be struggling with finding a position. It's a very small group of yeah. service members who struggle with post-traumatic stress, but in contrast, transition stress for most veterans is assessed to be like the biggest stress they've ever had in their lives. Maybe the key is to try to get corporate leaders to put themselves in the mindset of what if we took you out of your corporate environment and we threw you into the military? Sure. I mean, imagine what that would be like. It would be the same kind of stressors yeah. um, that military personnel experience. It was interesting to hear you talk about the repeal of don't ask, don't tell. Those changes, I can imagine, have their own challenges. You know, talking about social issues that are going on, whether it be mm -hmm. the LGBTQ and individuals being able to serve, social issues that we've encountered sitting in a military position, and you look out, what is the impact of this? I think that service members and veterans are just a cross-section of America. We don't have a warrior caste system where we're birthing Spartans and they go <laughs> live on an island and then they serve in the military. We all, all grew up in either rural America or inner cities or, you know, suburbia. We're products of those situations that we grew up in, the nature versus nurture. So the way we were nurtured kind of shapes us and then we're put into this melting pot. But there are some institutionalized schools of thought that I would say in the past 10 years and then even in this past year are really breaking apart due to great disruptors, positive disruptors. I grew up with one theme in the military that said there's only one color in the army and it's green. Well, I was really code for white. I never heard any of my black friends say there's only one color in the army. When DAT was repealed, that was actually the, the contrast I made for the soldiers that I had that were struggling in adopting. 70 years ago, our grandfathers were in a room that said, you know, Blacks are going to serve in our units, and we need to make space for that. We need to accept that. And that's the way, you know, your cultural norms are dictated to you. You're now accepting that. Now, personally, they may have a problem with it. But if they wanted to maintain their service, then they needed to adjust. And right. My friends that are gay, that are serving in the military, that have been serving in the military, this is a beautiful thing because they can be their authentic selves, and we can celebrate their service. And for so many that we were discharged because of what was in a terrible policy. I don't know that reparation is the right word to use, but I, I am happy to see that our politicians are looking at that and trying to repair the damage that those discharges did to those people's lives. We've also recently had to root out extremism in the military. Yeah. January 6th was a big eye-opener for a lot of people. There's varying degrees of affluence in the military, then there's varying degrees of intellectualism in the military, and I think that some of that is ge geographically based, but we don't define community by geography anymore, we define it by affinity. So if you're speaking the values that resonate with me, I'm going to be part of your community regardless of what post I'm assigned to or where I'm located in America. I could be in the deep south, but be part of a community that's somewhere completely different or isn't located anywhere because it's all virtual. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. As I was reading through your LinkedIn profile, I was struck by where you say you've established yourself as a leading voice in disrupting social narratives, designing innovative solutions for veterans. So tell me a little bit about that. I mean, it really stood out to me. It resonated. Some of the examples of that are far too often my sisters in arms who may have a, a veteran license plate or the sticker of a unit that they served in on their car are 
told too often, tell your husband, thank you for his service. Ah. So it's our generation's obligation to champion, you know, gender equality. All roles in the military are open to all genders. It's not even a gender question anymore. All are welcome. But we have these social um, stereotypes that we project onto people. I was mentioning like Magnum P.I. and Rambo. It was 1980s cinema that really project, presented veterans as deranged people, broken from war, for society to say all these people coming back from the global war on terror are some broken folks. It's not the norm. It's not, right. you know, so the more that we can popularize the success of people in their stories, the more we start to move the needle on how people view military service, who are those people and veterans. Cause you can put a group of veterans, you know, in a room and they still have all the generational biases that exist in regular society. Now we're an all volunteer force. Like nobody is compelled to serve today in the veteran space. Some things are different. My generation doesn't really care about a card carrying membership at a club that comes every Friday and tells war stories. Like I can connect with all the people I've served with through social media. When I get together, I want it to be, you know, less formal fundamentally social. I want to learn something new, you know, those types of things. So I feel privileged enough to be a, a, one of the initial leaders to integrate women into combat arms in the military. I'm a cavalry officer. I'm an armor officer by trade. And that means the Abrams tanks and Bradley's and ground maneuver warfare. And there's a lot of heritage that has had to shift and be respected in a different way. And when I say institutional biases, we have always promoted hyper-masculinity that just isn't acceptable anymore. Patton said, when I want my men to remember something, I give it to them double dirty. And he said, an army without profanity couldn't fight its way out of a piss-soaked paper bag. Yeah. But you can't use those words today. Obviously society and cultural norms have changed. You mentioned something before, if I looked back at 17 year old me, mm -hmm. if you could talk to 17 year old you about who you will become. Mm. I, I mentioned that I, I don't think I got all the best advice at that age, but I, I would have told myself there are only certain things that you can do that you need to be young to do. So those aspirations that you have built up for yourself, you need to jump on quickly because the train will leave the station and you're not going to be able to do those things. I would have told myself, be patient. You can make a way and all doors are not closed. One thing that's unique about the army is, or the military is, you know, we wear stuff on our chest. We wear rank on our chest. Any room I go into professionally, I'm assessed immediately like, oh, you're this, you're this professionally. So therefore I can determine X about you. There is some safety in that, frankly. There's some safety in the institution. Um, There's also some built-in bias by that, though, yeah. isn't there? Yeah, to totally. say, I'm going to define you by this very narrow criteria, yep. how many bars you have on your shoulder or whatever. Yep. Totally. I think that some of the things would really just be like lessons learned, like my wartime experience. I was an infantry company com commander in Iraq, and if people say, what did you learn from that? Some of the things that I learned have helped me professionally in that I learned that sometimes somebody else's best effort is good enough, which defeated my perfectionism, which really was born from being that all-American kid and captain of the swim team, and that I could make better decisions faster because when lives are on the line, the ancillary stuff that floats in the ether just wasn't important. That didn't mean that there were a lot of, you know, sleepless nights as a young person saying like, I've got to do this, it's got to be right, and I need that A or whatever. You know, that, that was great to motivate me to be, com I'm competitive by nature and, but how do you have healthy competition void yeah. of perfectionism? I, and I would totally agree with that. I think everybody should strive always to do the best that they can. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting that you brought that up because I had this discussion years and years ago with a coworker. The question was, do you give credit for effort? Mm -hmm. And we, we had this kind of heated debate and she served in the military actually and she was like no if there's not success at the end it doesn't matter and I, I disagree because 
if you're going to use that as the measuring stick, then people won't try mm -hmm. because the fear of failure will paralyze them from putting themselves out there. We're never always going to be good at everything that we do. Right. We're not always going to make the right decision. We make decisions with the information we have at the moment. My personal thought is, yes, effort does count, mm -hmm. right? A theme in the military is that the, the best units have rebranded themselves as learning organizations. And when you do that, there's some freedom for let's make the attempt because there might be an action due to fear of failure. But if you're a learning organization, that means we've given ourselves permission to attempt these things. And if we miss the mark, guess what? We will recock and start and try again. It's an iterative learning approach to results. And that's freeing for a lot of military organizations. And I see that in the corporate world too. Um, to varying degrees. Yeah. It depends on the organization. I've certainly had the experience of working for organizations that don't. But yes, that, that thing to say, this is what we wanted to achieve. And, and if you don't achieve it to say, that's okay, is there something that we can learn from that? I mean, it's kind of like life. I look at every hardship or setback as, you know, what am I supposed to learn from this particular experience? And is there a lesson in it or is there an opportunity? Yeah. And it gets more difficult when it's tied to a bottom line, like, oh, you bombed that presentation. Well, you learned a lot. That's great. You're going to be better next time. But if we lost that client or that sale or that acquisition because you bombed it, well, now, you know, I'm tolerating yeah. you less or so how do we well, do that? I always guide leaders to say, no matter what the situation, you should never take away somebody's dignity. Hmm. Even if you have to fire somebody for something egregious they did, your role isn't as judge and jury. Mm -hmm. It's to, that doesn't mean you can't do that with kindness. I always say even in the right. worst situations, it should be the best that it can be. Have that empathy yeah. and, and totally. care, care for people the same way you would want to be cared for. People make mistakes. Yeah. Obviously in the military, it could be a matter of, of life and death, which I'm sure adds a layer of complexity to the situations sometimes are not within our control. Yeah. The environment gets a vote. I mean, you know, in the military, we'll say, well, like, well, what are the attributes of the contemporary operating environment? Because that operating environment is different if I'm in a theater of operations or I'm in garrison at a post back stateside or even what office on that post I work in. There's different cultural or environmental effects that shape, you know, what's allowed and what isn't allowed and how much learning can occur based on what needs to get done or how vital it is the success of this project or person's work is. It's been great having this conversation with you. and Yeah, I'm really uh, glad we could connect. So real quick, what do you see in your future? Wow, that's a big question. Well, you know, the sun is setting on my military service. So I'm just now embarking on the, the strangeness and fears of transition. Fear is a difficult word to use. I'm not scared about it, but you know, the, the world is your oyster. But all these things we've been talking about ring true for me and, and, and my circumstances. So what's next for me is making friends, building the network. You know, I, I have a great life and I'm really thankful for all, all the the good things that have gone on with me. So I think identifying the next culture that I want to be a part of, the next organization that has those values that, you know, speak to me and a place where I can use this lived experience as an army officer to make an impact and a buck yeah. <laughs> and, and enjoy doing it. <laughs> yeah, we all have to eat, right? Right. If I was to give you any advice, which I don't think I need to, is make sure it's the right culture for you who you are now and who you want to be mm -hmm. because no amount of money or perks is going to get you past a bad culture mm -hmm. i appreciate that advice i mean the more i hear that and when it's authentically shared is meaningful i really appreciate you're taking an hour out of your day cool well i enjoyed it